Well, thank you very much, John. It's a pleasure to be here. Welcome to all of you. This evening, I'm going to give you something that very, very few people have ever given you, which is a clear definition of consciousness that you can understand. Because consciousness is defined in many rather circular ways. And these ways are vague. For example, what is consciousness? Well, consciousness is awareness. OK, well, what's awareness? Uh, well, uh, uh, it's perception. Uh, OK, so what's perception? Uh, well, it's consciousness. And round and round we go. And even though these definitions are sometimes very highfalutin, they don't really amount to very much. Because the very first thing you have to do is at least define something without using the same words that you're trying to define, which is the definition of a circular definition. So this is a huge issue, and it's uh, occupied many minds uh, from the earliest times to the present. And we will go on to ask one of the most interesting questions today is, is the mind the brain? This is a very, very common answer that is given chiefly in what would pass for scientific circles. That is to say, your consciousness, your mind, is simply the sum total of a number of functions of your brain all of which can be mapped if you stick neurons and neurons in your head and all sorts of things. Um, the only difficulty with this is that this has never been proven. The actual step taken from all of these brain functions to how they end up creating a cognizing subject is left completely vague and unknown. There's something that I will call promissory materialism, because this answer has been given for decades now at least, and they're always just about to give you the answer. Uh, we'll get back to you on that. It's going to be real soon. It's real soon. Uh, very much like the theory of everything that um, the physicists 30 years ago were really quite sure that we would have uh, 30 years later, meaning today. This is uh, a bit of, I would say, scientific or scientistic arrogance. And it has pervaded our cultural life and done a great deal more damage uh, to our souls and our minds and our emotions that I can really possibly describe uh, this evening nor will I try to do so. But let me go on to take one just very simple slice of this whole problem. Consciousness is a precondition of being. Now that is a C.G. Jung statement, and it can serve as a prelude to a great deal of what I'm about to say. Again, is the brain the mind? One step was taken in suggesting that the brain and its functions were not the mind came from a very, very famous philosophical article published in 1974 by Thomas Nagel. And it is, that is its title. What's it like to be a bat? Now, as most of you know, bats don't see very well. I'm told that they're not completely blind, but their capacity for vision is rather strained or limited, which is not all that much of a problem because most of the time they're flittering around in darkness in caves and such places. The other thing is that they have an auxiliary sense by which they perceive and navigate. 
and it is a form of sonar. Sonar meaning you bounce a kind of sound beam off something, it bounces back to you, and that gives you an idea of how far away it is. Now that is very simple, very easy to describe. And human beings understand sonar and how to use it. For example, the Navy uses sonar to sound the depths of the oceans. They bounce this beam back and they, they look at how long it takes to come back and that tells them how deep the ocean is at that point. So we understand an enormous amount about sonar. But there's one thing we are not going to understand. What it's like to actually have this sense subjectively. What is it like to see with sonar? We're never going to be able to do that because we don't have sonar as a sense. And this led various thinkers to be a little bit more suspicious of this argument that it can all be reduced to brain processes, a view known as materialism in philosophy of mind. Materialism has many different meanings, but materialism in philosophy of mind means the mind is the brain and just functioning thereof. So this has become more and more problematic, and it even led to the formulation of this philosophical concept known as qualia. Qualia is a plural uh, from the Latin, the singular is quale. Uh, and it means, what is something like? That is to say, when you perceive, all these things are going in through your mind, through your eyes, through your uh, ears, through your nose. But, and we can just understand the neural processes, but we've still not gotten our hands around what it actually feels like to be that subject. And that's where it is now. And the fact that this question has not really been answered, even though the neurology gets more and more sophisticated every year, every month, every day, because they're constantly doing these tests, what part of the brain has to do with what, they still haven't gotten to this. And from the point of view of the nature of consciousness, it strongly, strongly suggests that they are asking the wrong question. And we'll see how. Well, as you can see, this is a very, very subtle, difficult, and large question. So why don't we start with something a little bit simpler? Why don't we start by creating the universe? What do you do if you're going to create the universe? Well, I guess if you're going to create something, you're going to start with nothing. So that's what you have, nothing, signified by the primordial symbol for nothing, which is a black screen. That's what you're starting with. Well, what, what, then, what then do you? do? Well, we're creating the universe. It, I guess it has to be something. I mean, even if you don't know what it is, it has to be something. Okay, let's make it something. And let's again use one of the most primordial and universal symbols for this, which is a point. If you, this, by the way, all of the things I'm about to say in the next half hour or so uh, cast an enormous amount of light on um, symbolism around the world. Because if these things are true, they must be universally true. And therefore, they must have been discovered many different times independently in many different ways. And the descriptions, the symbols for them will um, at least resemble one another. So, all right, here we have, we have something and we have nothing, okay? We have two things now. By the way, we're 
talking about this from a third person perspective as if we're God out here creating the universe. But that's not the way it works. In a sense, you could say that this point here is I sitting here, whatever it is. There's me, there's self, and then there's everything else. In order for anything to exist, it has to have that primordial characteristic. And we'll see how far this goes uh, as we develop this idea later on. Meaning, you've got two things now. Well, you have one thing, don't you? But you have another thing, which is this, this background here. So you have two things. You have self and you have other. Okay? Here's one quotation from Francis Tizo, um, who's actually a Catholic priest uh, for ancient Indian and Tibetan science, and atom was thought of as an infinitesimal metaphysical construct. So this is what an atom was. What was an atom? This. Uh, to understand what this is about, you're gonna have to set aside your concept of the atom as you learned it in chemistry class. We're talking about something far prior to that. So, you've got a self and an other. Let's symbolize it by these two points. If they are to exist at all, to be aware of their own existence, if, if even if the self is supposed to be aware of itself against the universe, it has to see the universe as other. So, we have self, and other. Again, this is, this is you know, a two-dimensional thing that is attempting to describe, well, a multi-dimensional reality. And a, a multi-dimensional reality that goes you know, far further than even the sub, 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 sub atomic physics. Although I have seen physics studies I came across one today, for example, that is coming toward a theory of everything that has diagrams actually very much like the ones I'm about to show you. I'm not gonna use them here because frankly, I don't know to what extent my ideas resemble theirs, but I do see science converging with this fundamental theory of everything toward some of the ideas that I'm exploring here. So there's this self and there's this other, but there has to be something else. Because, oh, by the way, this is uh, an arbitrary supposition, right? Um, it could well just as well be, it could just as well not be. It, in a sense, it exists in that it's here, but from the, the point of view of the absolute, it didn't really happen. The absolute is unchanged. But in order for it to have any kind of sense of itself as opposed to the other, well, that's the definition. That is the definition I promised. Consciousness relates self and other. You can't just have self and other because if you did, they would be in totally different universes. They would not be aware of ex others' existence and from the point of view of the one, the other might as well not exist. You'll see many descriptions of possible universes and multiverses, some of which we can imagine, some of which we can. What about a universe in which the number three comes before the number two? Or in which the number six is divisible by four? Because these numerical relations are primary constituents of reality as we know it. Someone might say there is no possible world in which six can be divided by four. 
well, <laughs> at least there's no possible world that we know or can conceive of. It's so far away that it's, there's no relationship between us and it, so it might as well not exist. For anything in our world, in our uh, reality, there has to be some relation. Now, the other thing is that this is not a one-way road. This arrow here uh, points both ways. So you could just as well flip this around and put self here and other here, because that other is also kind of aware of that other as a self is aware of the other. Here's one definition. You, you will actually find definitions like this when consciousness is present. This is from some man at the University of London. When consciousness is present, consciousness of something is also present. Conversely, when phenomenal content is absent, consciousness is absent. Now, the most easy uh, example to cite is right now you're listening to this. You're watching this. You're having some experience of this. That is, you know, shall we say, consciousness of something, or as philosophers like to say, phenomenal content. But what if you fall asleep? What if you fall asleep and you go into completely deep sleep? You're totally unaware of this, uh, as will happen sometime tonight when you go to bed. You're t you will be totally unaware of your surroundings. You will be in a state of deep sleep. In that case, you are unconscious. Or part of you is. Part of you is. Because as you know, if you're gonna wake up in the morning, there are a lot of vital processes that are gonna have to go on. Some of them may well involve dealing with others. Like, for example, we live in the time of coronavirus, uh, and what is the most universal remedy offered for that disease or any disease for that matter? It's sleep. Meaning that while your conscious mind sleeps, your unconscious mind can devote that much more energy to fighting off the pathogens, the others. So that is not complete unconsciousness. Complete unconsciousness in this sense only happens when you're dead. At least theoretically. We're not going to talk about life after death tonight. That's, this is, as you can already uh, see, this is all quite enough. Now I'm going to give you the whole the description of these two in terms of Hindu philosophy. This comes from the Sankhya, which is the oldest philosophical system known in the world. Uh, the Sankhya is regarded as an influence on the Buddha, and I believe Buddhist texts say as much. The Buddha lived in the 6th century BC, so it's older than that. How much older, we don't know. But there is that, it's called Purush to use what I believe is the correct Sanskrit pronunciation. That is self. Prakriti, did you know that um, R is a, a vowel in Sanskrit? Well, apparently it is. Uh, and that is probably something like its pronunciation, is the other. That the, the whole f uh, a phenomenal content is prakriti. And the Samkhya philosophy is very elaborate, uh, and it goes much further than I'm going to go into it here. Uh, self is actually entirely still in the Samkhya philosophy. It does nothing but watch. All of the activity, everything, the movement, is prakirti. The silent self, it's also called Atman in Hindu philosophy, simply watches. Does absolutely nothing but 
the fact that it cognizes makes everything go around. And that everything going around, that whole panoply of the world, it is, is what is known as prakriti. It would be much easier to understand what I'm talking about if you have some meditative experience. And I believe that many forms of meditation are designed in one way or another to lead to this insight. What is you? You are this. You are the silent watcher. You are not your physical body or your physical responses because you can step back and watch those. Sometimes people in great pain who don't have any uh, opioids or anything around only manage to mitigate the pain by stepping back and watching it from a distance. Similarly with your thoughts, your emotions, you can watch them pass as images on a screen. Again, that's what certain forms of meditation are for. So you, if you can watch these things from a distance, you must not be them. Therefore, what are you? And it is the self, the watcher, according to Hindu thought. But this idea has many, many parallels in many, many different traditions. Because if it is true, it's universally true. And a lot of people will have described it and discussed it uh, in terms that made most sense to them. Oh, by the way, if you were to ask me what the secret of the universe was, I would say that. If you understand that, you understand a great deal. In fact, the Hindu sage Sri Ramana Maharshi said, if you take the question, who am I, back far enough, you will become enlightened. And I think it is the nature of this self, which is not just a point that stops somewhere but goes back infinitely, that he was talking about. This is, an, uh, of course, a very familiar symbol from a completely different tradition. You all rec uh, recognize it as the Yang Yin symbol. And I would say that this illustrates some of the idea that I was trying to talk about. Let's say this is self. This black part is other, right? Well, but we said that the black part is self too. And for it, the white part is other. That's why this has a white part in it, even though it's black. And this has a black part in it, even though it's white. This is a reciprocal relationship. And it is the primordial, shall we say, according to Taoism and similar traditions, the primordial relationship of the universe. Again, there are two things here, but there is a third thing, which is the relationship that encompasses them both. OK. Let's put it in a. Uh, simpler diagrammatic form, self-other relation. OK, self-other relation. Without one, the other can't really be. You can't have self and a relation without an other, right? You can't have self and other without the relation. And you can't have a relation and other without the self. This is an ongoing, continuous dynamic symbolized. Again, obviously, this is just a very, very simple way. But uh, the simpler you can illustrate something like, the more simply you can illustrate something like that, the better. And this has many different names in many different traditions. Gurdjieff, the uh, great uh, 20th century uh, spiritual teacher, called them holy affirming holy denying, holy reconciling, self-other relation. In the Chinese tradition, this was heaven, this was earth, and man, humanity, was seen as the reconciling force. And here's a, another diagrammatic description of this. 
Here's another illustration of it. One of the most famous. The Holy Trinity. Now, this is a, a Greek Orthodox, or at least a Greek Orthodox style icon. And because the Trinity isn't picturable, because except it, because it would look really abstract, like something like that, um, it's pictured in this form. And these are uh, a story from Genesis in which three men, and th that they're described as men, uh, visit Abraham. And traditional teachings say that they are the three persons of the Trinity as portrayed here. Again, you will see description, images of the Trinity this way. You could say this is the Father, this is the Son, this is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the relation, the comforter, the reconciler. The Father is progenitor, the Son is the generated. This is, shall we say, the relation between the two of them. The, this, a, a Christian would say, everything that I've just told you is a mere pallid reflection of the doctrine of the Trinity, reflected in the most insignificant way in this world. Well, that may be, that it may not be. I would prefer to say that the Trinity is one of many pictures of this sacred triad or ternary that are again found universal, that is again found universally. Well, does the process stop here? Not really, because this starts to form an entity of its own. And if that's so, it becomes a self. And then the rest of it, everything around it is other. And we can portray it this way, a second other. The, uh, the Kabbalah of the Jews had this representation for it. This is the four letter name of God. Tetragrammaton, sometimes said to be pronounced Yahweh, although I personally do not believe that's the correct pronunciation. Tetragrammaton simply means four letters, so there are the four letters. It, Hebrew is light, right to left, so Y-H-W-H. And you can see what's going on here. Here's the self, here's the other, here's the relation, and here's the other, the second other. There is not a fourth force, right? This is not a different letter from this. This is this force, the other repeated. And that is why, how many letters are there in the tetragrammaton? Well, you kind of have to, well, there's one, two, three, four, but only there are only one, two, three different ones. And this idea appears a great deal. And one individual who was uh, very much taken with it was the psychologist C.G. Jung. C.G. Jung actually saw an echo of this idea at the beginning of Plato's dialogue, the Timaeus, which begins one, two, three. But where is the fourth? That was here yesterday. And this concept of what Jung called the quaternio, the quaternary, uh, always has this aspect. There are three forces and there's something else, which is not another force, but this repeated. You can take this symbolism all sorts of ways. You can go back to the Christian Trinity. Well, who would this fourth be? Well, the, the, perhaps the individual who, particularly in Catholicism and orthodoxy is worshiped almost more than Jesus or God himself, which is the Virgin. She is there, but she's not part of the Trinity. 
She's not God because she's not this three. Again, Christian dogma is a way of, one way of grasping and expressing this. I would say, again, I think it would be a horrible mistake to say that this is the one version and everything else is like a degenerate heretical imitation or counterfeit of it. I, I think that's, uh, well, just wrong. So this goes on. This is an iterative process. These then become another self. And th there's another around it. And this goes on and on and on and on and on. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how you create the universe. So says the Tao Te Ching. The, the Tao begot one, one begot two, two begot three, and three begot the 10,000 things all because this process reiterates itself. Constant uh, self and other down from the very smallest levels down to the very highest, up to the very highest. So there it is, there's the universe or some picture of it or imagined picture of it. And it all goes back to this relation of self and other. Now, one person who understood this was Thomas Edison. As you know, I'm speaking to you under the auspices of the Theosophical Society. And Thomas Edison was one of the first members of the Theosophical Society. He, according to a, a Wikipedia source I saw today, he was the 162nd person to join the Theosophical Society in its history. He wasn't a very active member but he certainly uh, was inspired by its ideas. By the way, this is true of many great scientists. They were not necessarily theosophists, but the ideas that theosophy and similar esoteric traditions represent were very, very much of interest to them. Another person who was very interested in these ideas was Einstein. And theosophists love to tell the story that Einstein kept a copy of H.P. Blavatsky's Secret Doctrine, which is kind of the central text of theosophy, on his desk. And I read an interview with him and, and found that was true. He said, yes, I do. I find it very useful uh, for dipping in uh, to when my mind is stuck on a problem. I wrote a letter to my friend Professor Heisenberg suggesting that he do the same. In this particular context, in this particular interview, he was wrestling with a question of the nature of the atom. Because if you think about it, atoms are kind of a problematic thing. In 1900, physicists believed that atoms were indivisible. That they were just these little hard particles that could never be destroyed or, I suppose, created. This idea goes all the way back to Democritus uh, in the fifth century Greece. And although it wasn't universally accepted between then and the present, it was um, also not particularly changed. But then scientists started to realize that you could divide the atom further into protons and neutrons and electrons, uh, which you certainly learn in any elementary chemistry class. Oh, then it turns out these protons and these neutrons and these electrons themselves can be divided into smaller and smaller and smaller particles. This gets to be a problem because well, is this an infinite regress? You guess, in which case, you know, it could lead, you know, kind of evaporates in our hands. Or do you get to a point where you have just a really, really tiny hard bit of material that's an atom, which if it existed, would be the most mysterious thing of all. And Einstein was occupied with this. What his answers were, 
I'm sure may be found in his writings and his formulae and whatnot. But I would say that eventually, if you were going to go back and find the place where it all started, it would have to be expressed in language very much like this. Now, let's go back to, to the subject that we started with. Human consciousness, the mind and the brain. Why, I said this was probably the wrong question to ask, so why is it the wrong problem? Because here's how it's phrased. How out of this whole massive universe, all these swirling atoms and whatnot, and forces and cosmic rays and whatnot, did human consciousness arise? That answer really can't be, uh, a question can't really be answered on its own terms because it assumes that human consciousness is this freak. There's this whole mechanical world of things pounding around and, and bouncing around uh, totally mindlessly and by George, human consciousness appeared. Which if, again, would, it would be the most miraculous thing of all. And I suppose it would be if it were unique. But according to the theory I'm giving here, human consciousness is not unique because the self-other relationship pervades the entire universe at all levels. And Edison saw this. Every atom is possessed by a certain amount of primitive intelligence. Well, that all sounds very mystical. And uh, of course, the greater the scientist is, the more mystical he sounds unfortunately for the rationalistic materialist who somehow thinks that um, eighth grade physics can explain every possible thing there is in the entire world. What he's saying there is an atom of hydrogen the simplest element known, must nevertheless possess some level of the capacity to recognize what is around it. It must be able in some way, as he said, primitive intelligence, it must be able at least to recognize, shall we say, an oxygen atom and combine with it under certain circumstances to form water. It must, in its own primitive way, know the difference between an oxygen atom and, say, a helium atom, with which it cannot form water. That is why he said this. Gathered together in certain forms, the atoms constitute animals of the lower orders. Finally, they combine in man who represents the total of intelligence of all the atoms. Well, that may or may not be the case. Human beings love uh, to point out how unique they are and how different they are. Human beings are different from all the other animals in that we possess, you know, X sorts of qualities. And then it turns out, well, <laughs> I read a, a, or I saw a piece a, a day or so ago that said uh, we have to con take the, the idea of octopus civilizations seriously, which means that, hey, we may not even be unique in uh, being able to create civilizations. Nonetheless, we think we are. My whole point in all this is this all goes bound to this primordial self and other relation. And whether you characterize it atomistically, and when I'm talking about these points and whatnot, I said they're, they're abstract constructs. So they go way back before even the most elementary uh, subatomic particles. The only thing that makes those the smallest is that they're the smallest our scientific apparatus can perceive. 
No doubt it goes back way, 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 way further. And we're only going to be able to understand that conceptually by taking some very, very basic principles, which seem to be recognized and seem to be highlighted in many of the great sacred traditions and expressed, as you've seen, symbolically, whether it's a Greek Orthodox icon of the Trinity, uh, whether it's the Hebrew tetragrammaton, it's whether it's, or the yin and yang symbol, these are all point us toward this. And the thing about a symbol that makes it so powerful is that it goes past the, um, shall we say, verbal mind. It speaks, these pictures, those images speak to us at a different level. And if contemplated in a certain way, can um, bring some of that insight. That's why those symbols are worth contemplating in many different forms, in many different ways. We live in a time when many traditions are available, and they all seem to be at war, which is kind of a bad thing. But the good thing is that they're all out there, and we can look at them and say, wow, I see this idea here in Shark Cathedral. I see it uh, in the Tao Te Ching. I see it all sorts of, I see it in the Kabbalah. I see it all sorts of places. And you, then you must realize these are universal things that are basic to our experience as humans. Well, that is quite a bit. But in short, human consciousness is one form of the universal consciousness. It is one bandwidth on this, as far as we can tell, infinite spectrum of consciousness going back to perhaps some very, very basic uh, particles of the sort I describe, to some atomic particles, to us, to minerals, to um, animals, to us, supposedly the uh, sum total of all the atoms' intelligence, but further on to galaxies, solar systems, universes. What consciousness does a galaxy have? I think it's worth contemplating and I believe that a galaxy possesses a certain kind of consciousness. But I would also have to admit that what that consciousness might be would be very, very difficult for us uh, to imagine, much less know. Well, I have covered these themes in some of my books. Uh, the one that discusses these subjects most thoroughly is a book called The Dice Game of Shiva, which is how consciousness creates the universe. And since you've heard this lecture, you at least have some idea of my ideas in this regard. Conscious love, well, let's say it goes back to relation. Love is a relationship. So for that matter is hate. Uh, but that deals with the relational aspects of this self and other distinction. And here's my latest book, A Theology of Love, Reimagine Christianity Through a Course in Miracles, which is a very profound spiritual teaching, uh, which was published in the 1970s. Some of you are familiar with it. Uh, I think it is the greatest spiritual text of the 20th century. And it is perhaps the only logical, sensible, and coherent Christian theology that I have ever come across. And the good news is that it's love, not fear. So I hope you will uh, check out my books. I'm, I won't go through all the others. But thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure. And I hope you found some enjoyment and. Uh, information out of all this. Have a good evening.